Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning um, at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later in our show archives um, for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of today's show um, where all those show archives are. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you might uh, think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so similar to your state library. Um, and so we provide services and training and resources and grants uh, to um, all sorts of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live um, for all types of libraries, public, academic, uh, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, really our only criteria is it's something to do with libraries. We have, have um, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we sometimes bring in guest speakers on the show from outside of the commission, but we also have commission staff that do presentations for us. And that is what we have today. And today is, I can't believe I'm going to say it, it's the last Wednesday of the month. It's also the last Wednesday of 2023. Oh, my Whoa. God. Yeah. <laughs> so, weird. is everybody ready for 2024? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> warm. Yeah. It's okay. We got this. But it is the last Wednesday of a month. So, that means we have, it's pretty sweet tech day. Um, every last Wednesday of the month uh, throughout the year, Amanda Sweet, who's our technology innovation librarian here at the Library Commission. Good morning, Amanda. She comes on and talks to us, um, shares with us something techie related. Um, we do have tech shows other times during the month too, sometimes, but you can always depend on the last Wednesday of, month, of the month will be Amanda um, and her pretty sweet tech session. And she's gonna talk about an, a real cool service she started up here at the Commission I don't even know how long ago, a couple years, maybe? I think it, it's been a few years now, yeah. Um, our Tech Kits Through the Mail program. So I'm just gonna hand it over to you, Amanda, to tell us all about what's going on with that new That's thing. <laughs> and I guess now that I think about it, it actually started shortly before COVID, but then the world kind of paused right. for a while, and then it kind of jumped back up. It paused. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. The world just kind of shut it down for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so this is all about the tech kit through the mail. And I think this was started right around 2019-ish, but we don't speak of that time. The before and, times. In the right? Before times. But these are the after times. <laughs> And so in this one, I'm going to talk about how this service kind of works, how it got started, how it's being used. I get some really cool pictures about have people having fun with robots and stuff. So I wish I had actually added those to the slideshow now that I say that out loud, but I <laughs> didn't. So next time. <laughs> and I just added some, I'll talk about the kits that are available right now. Then I'll mention the new kits that I just recently added. Some of them actually still need barcodes, but that doesn't take that long. And then I'll talk about how these kits can be used to kind of introduce new and different careers, some of the extra resources that I put together, and just some fun different ways that you can use it. I've been adding stuff. So just as like a brief overview of what the tech kits are, it's basically you get to check out um, any, we have robotics kits, drone kits, virtual reality headsets. We've got a ton of stuff. It's actually easier to just open up the page that has the listing of everything because I didn't memorize all of them, even though I picked them. Well, there's so, a lot. Yeah. And I will <laughs> mention too, while we're, 
you know, popping between your slides and the website here. Um, the slides will be available to everyone. We'll have a link to those um, when the show archive goes up as well. So if you want, you want that for your own reference, um, we'll have a link to those slides for you. And there is a link to this main page, and the page. This is also the page to request a kit. So mm -hmm. I used to just have these little tiles that had the links to the resources. But people requested just a full-on list right at the top, just so they know what they're working with. So everything, that, want to know everything that's available right off the bat. And to be fair, it is probably easier that way. So I did add it up there. And probably the next question that I usually get is, which ones are the most popular kits that go out? And the answer randomly is that it's seasonal. And I think it's mostly like different kits get used during the school year and the drones get more used during the summer and fall than they do in the cold winter months. Sure, sure. It, it makes sense. Yeah. But overall, the Oculus Quest 2, the during the summer, the DJI Telos, the Ozobot evos i need to change the ozobot bit to the evo because they no longer make the they're no longer making the bit which is the original ozobot version they've switched over to the evo so i've already replaced everything in the collection with the evo but apparently i didn't change that one word so <laughs> what are you gonna do <laughs> but it's correct once you get in there it's true That's yeah true. order something sure sure and the Snap Circuit Extreme is this big honking kit that comes in this giant black case. But in hindsight, after I got that one, it costs a lot to ship. So mm -hmm. that kit has gotten a lot of use because Snap Kits are amazing, they're awesome, they're popular. But I just recently added the Snap Kit Green Energy Kit just because it's smaller, it's lightweight, and it's cheaper to ship back and forth. And I'll probably add other snap circuits just because the extreme is indeed extreme and it gives you like a lot of activity options, but it weighs like 20 plus pounds. Wow. So yeah, a little bit. And randomly enough, the kits that get the least circulation right now are the Google smart home devices. And that's mostly just because they don't come with um, pre-packaged activities that you can do with them. They're mm -hmm. geared more toward libraries that want to experiment with different smart tech, like smart bulbs and the display screen. Mm -hmm. So one way that libraries have started using that is that they'll put the like a doorbell over by their front desk so that if you're a solo librarian and you have to be out in the library helping someone else, you can put the doorbell up front to keep the monitor with you or even the app on your phone. And when someone rings the doorbell at the front, you can pull out your phone and talk to them from anywhere in the library. Nice. So that's a way that libraries can experiment with that and see how it actually works. Mm -hmm. So that's Very more like, for those solo librarians that we have in so many libraries across the state. There's a ton of them. I mean, they're everywhere. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> so that's more for, and you can also use it with patrons to do workshops that show how smart bulbs work. And mm -hmm. if people were confused about how they, how to program routines, um, there's also smart plugs in there. So you can, plug a lamp into a smart plug and then plug a smart bulb into a different lamp and show the difference of how that works. And then you can also create rooms so that like in the over Christmas, um, my dad actually set up his Christmas lights so that he just tells Alexa, turn on Christmas lights, turn off Christmas lights. Nice. And we're all too lazy to just go, go get up and do it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> We have, I have a little remote for a power thing outside, but I do have to stand up and go to the window and go click. <laughs> oh, we don't even do that. <laughs> so we can and, be even lazier. Awesome. <laughs> right. Go cool, laziness. <laughs> and so if you have like. Serving energy. Let's be positive about this. It's there positive. we go. <laughs> We're lazily conserving energy. That's the best kind. And then, so. 
that does the lights on the tree and the lights outside. So mm -hmm. it's all just in one thing. So mm -hmm. if you do have like Christmas lights or even just any plug-in device, you can find out how that works and find out how to program it. And usually when people try that using this free service and kind of get a feel for how it works, they're more comfortable with actually putting the money out to get their own thing. So that's great for both libraries and for customer and for library patrons that were kind of hesitant about smart tech and trying to, the ones who didn't want to actually buy it before they could have to hold it in their hands. Yeah. And so that is a list of what's there. I'm not adding the green circuits onto this main list until they're all fully barcoded. I've already barcoded two of them and they've already been shipped out because someone requested them. But I'll get to the rest of them. And so these are all shipped to you through the Library Commission using the USPS or UPS, depending on how many of them there are and if you need them right away. Um, Bruce in the mailroom kind of works with magic to figure out how that all works because he, he's got a system. I let him do his thing. <laughs> and um, If you're close by to Lincoln, um, you can also pick them up. So a lot of the local libraries that are within maybe an hour or so, they'll actually just pick them up and drop them off. Or if you have relatives in the area or you're frequently over here, um, a lot of people save on shipping just by dropping them off in person. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of amazed the number of people who make regular circuits to Lincoln, Omaha, but yeah. it's there. We see people a lot that could pop in here, yeah. And then some people wanted to know what happens if I horribly, horrifically destroy a kit. Luckily, that has not happened. The worst that's happened so far is that I've lost some propellers on drones and some darts and some, um, the Q robot blaster, he shoots darts out of his little attachment. <laughs> so I was expecting to lose darts or darts get bent even in my niece and nephew's Nerf gun. So that's just gonna happen. And propellers only last for so long. So I do have like a case of propellers just for replacement. So, this is the tech kit lending agreement. So if you want to know what happens if you horribly, horrifically destroy or maim a robot, which I recommend maybe not, but <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so I've heard about I in other, that, yeah. right? Yeah. You know? So like this is here, I believe we landed on more than 30% of the kit is missing that the bar the borrower will be charged for the cost of the entire kit and again so far this hasn't happened so knock on wood and so you are welcome to and if you are another state that's looking at putting together um a tech kit program like this i would actually recommend looking through this uh, lending agreement because even if it never happens, it's like an insurance policy for like liability against the library commission and for the individual library itself. This is geared more toward liability and safety for the state library. And then it's recommended that for more complex equipment that the individual library also might not want their own policies. Sure, sure. So where that's actually come into play is the Oculus, the Oculus Quest. So let me go to the policies and virtual reality waiver. So this virtual reality waiver is actually available for use by school, public, academic, any library that is using a virtual reality headset. And this is mostly in play just because sometimes people get nauseous and even though the even though there's built-in technology so that inside inside the oculus quest 2 headset so that people won't run into different things sometimes it happens people can get discombobulated especially if they've never used virtual reality before or if they've accidentally mislaid their um boundary line where they so they don't run into stuff it sometimes happens it's rare but it happens 
So this is something that's in play to protect the individual library. And then by extension, the state library who distributed the equipment in the first place, because we live in kind of a lawsuit heavy society now. Sometimes it's warranted, sometimes maybe not so much, but it's, e it's easier and safer to have this in place than not. And right now, I think we landed on this is not required for each individual use, but if, the, if something happens, we may have to change that. Mm -hmm. And some individual libraries use this just because their library board um, won't let them use the equipment unless they have something like this in place. So it's come up. Yeah. And there's also infographics that I put together that will that you can hand out at the start of every virtual reality session that just makes people aware of what could possibly go wrong so that you can know that you have proof that you actually showed that they were aware of what could potentially go wrong. I hate having to actually go through all the liability stuff. There's a reason I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but it's important and, and I think libraries yeah. know it and have yeah. been doing things liability type. Yeah. I'm gonna deal with all sorts of any sort of program or anything with people coming into the library to attend. So similar. Even the book challenges, no one wants to write the policies, but you still have to. Better to be prepared than have to scramble if something happens. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So now you know. So now I'm going to talk about the kits that were just very recently added along with some of the fun cool accessories. So this is the Tony's box. And this is something that I actually came across at, um, it was either computers or li and libraries or internet librarians. And normally I choose kits based on their ability to introduce people to like industry 4.0 technology and like new careers and community impacts and stuff. But I also got a lot of requests from libraries that were looking for tech gadgets for younger users. So this is actually a, you put one of these little Tonys on top of that box and it automatically reads stories or plays songs and it's tactile. So if you tilt it to the side, to the left, to the right, shake it, it does different actions. Do I remember what each and one of those actions are right now? Not even a little bit. But that is why they, Tony's has this really cool how it works tutorial. And this is probably the quickest and easiest kit that you can actually start using. I maybe recommend not putting up crumbled up cookies all over the box, but it is still a cool picture. So you can see how this is the Tony box itself. This little cookie monster dude, this figurine is called a Tony. And when you stick it on top, there's a magnet at the bottom of this Tony. That magnet um, communicates with the box that there's now a Tony sitting on there. And it will also, by QR code, let it know which Tony it is. So the box knows which um, file to play. And then it's in like the little sensors inside the box will let the kid be able to tilt it to change songs and stuff. And they have like a, each one of the kits that go through the tech kits of the mail, they'll come with five different Tonys and then one creative Tony. And the creative Tony is pretty awesome because it actually lets you record your own stuff. Uh -huh. So you can record a story, you can record like, um, people have used it for like Tony's genealogy so that grandparents can record their own like stories from the past or stories from the community. Oh, and that's then awesome. Right now, <laughs> and now you're passing stories down through the generations, and you're like sharing community impact stories or sharing like genealogy stories, and you can actually record that and just keep it on that Tony. And I thought that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And of course, we don't have every single Tony because they keep coming out with different ones, but I went by theme. So there's a Disney Princess pack. There is a um, Cars, Planes, and Trains pack. There's classic stories. 
There's um, stories that are based on books. So you can also pair this and do like a story hour with the actual book and then pass around the Tony box that actually has the Tony that, from the book that they just read. And they have some cool stuff. So that is the one that's for younger users. And then we jump over to, this is the green energy one that um, is already, I'm still barcoding it. As I mentioned, two are barcoded, they're already out. But there are up to 15 copies available of this one. And there's up to 15 copies available of each one of the different kits. So if you, I'm sure that a lot of you have already used Snap Circuits, but they actually have a book that's available in here that will also guide you through all these specific activities. And in the slideshow, you can also preview the, ma the manual. I'm willing to bet that people accidentally lose the manual to this a lot. So you can also print and download your own. Mm -hmm. And you can also preview all the available activities to see if, what, to kind of pre-plan which ones you actually want to do. And then you can get the most use out of the 30 days that you have the kit over there. And it also introduces like different green energy and clean energy um, careers and helps people understand how they work. So these have actually been, the original Snap Circuit Extreme kit has been used for all age ranges. Like they've been used for K through 12 classrooms, but they've also been used by adults. They've been used in retirement homes. They've been used in developmental disability um, facilities. They've been used in just a variety of different places. So even helping adults get a feel for the new green energy careers that are out there is pretty awesome. And I also like the tiny little windmill. It's cute. <laughs> yes. And so let me close these tabs so that they're not all over. And so the Finch has been in the collection for a little bit, but I added some new stuff to it. So they have some 3D printable accessories that are made for the Finch. So I actually worked with Do Space to get all like a whole bunch of stuff just 3D printed. And Do Space is like a technology library that's in based out of Omaha. And they just have, they started a new service where you can actually send in a print file and the like do space staff will print it for you. And then you can pick it up and pay for it. And that's way easier than trying to block off like the 10 to 15 hours that it would have taken to print all the stuff that I wanted printed. And it came in handy. So mm -hmm. what I, that a lot of people don't know about 3D printing that it is it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's not a quickie. I'm just gonna pop in and print this off and like a piece of paper. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Five hours later. <laughs> and fun fact, we were actually the first one to use Do Space's 3D print service because they made it the day before I asked them about it. And then they said, do you want to be the first one to use it? And I was like, let's do this thing. I would be <laughs> the <mistake>, yes. <laughs> right. So one of the first things that was printed was this phone holder. So this phone holder actually gets mounted, and it might be easier to see it if I blow it up a little. So the base robot is down here. There's a little hole that normally you would put a marker in this hole that's in the middle, and then the marker would draw lines on a mat. But they replaced it so that there's now a little pole that goes down into the middle of the robot, and it secures the phone carrier. So when you mount your phone to the phone holder, you can now make like a, a roving robot that can take um, video. So if you were to open up a Zoom session on your phone and then send your robot out and about, then it's like a spy bot 
and you can also build like um like if you were to imagine a robot that's going out into a mine shaft or going out into like a rescue robot you're sending the robot ahead to take video data and then um report back what it finds so you can start marking off safe zones that are where that are where humans are able to go and you can also find um like a any people animals things that need to be rescued and repaired so one of the activities that i actually started writing out was um it's basically like a rescue mission so you just get a whole bunch of different barbies and then you get some lego rubble and then you half cover like a barbie with the lego rubble and then you have to send the robot in to count the number of barbies that need to be rescued and then you have to jot down like the type of rescue that they need. Are they covered in rocks? Are they like stuck under, or, like stuck in a tree? What do we actually need to be able to save these Barbies? And now we're sending the robot in ahead of time to collect the information and send it back to the humans that are going to come in and rescue and do like the Barbie rescue. Hmm. Plus, I have fun Barbie. covering <laughs> Barbies in like a rubble. What's fun? And let me bounce this back down. And so the same people who make the Finch 2.0 robot, Bird Brain Technologies, they also make the Hummingbird bit. And this is one thing that I did not print all of the different items that are able to be printed because most of them are replacement parts for things that are in the box but one thing that i'm looking to add to the collection is this hummingbird rover so the base model of the hummingbird bit kit it just uses this little board that's the computer that's going to be telling all the different parts what to do and then it includes all these different sensors like a distance sensor, a temperature sensor, and all those different cool stuff. And it also has this little collection of motors and some different things that you can use to attach the motor to different things. This was actually designed so that you could use cardboard and different found materials to create different projects. So you can create like a living play or you can create um, a motorized parade float exhibit there are some activities in there to create like motorized um, dinosaur heads or you can make like a Halloween display so that it jerks and turns as soon as someone walks by and you can freak people out. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can use it. But what Hummingbird Bit is trying to get across is that you don't just have to use the cardboard that's written in the instructions. You can also start 3D printing and designing your own accessories. So if your library has access to a 3D printer, you can also create your own stuff. And if you don't have access to a 3D printer, the first thing I recommend is looking local. You might have your own do space equivalent or you might have a local place that has a 3D printer that's available to the public. Or if you don't, there's also a 3D printing service that's online. So, and I'm going to make sure that this is the right one here. Oops, I have a new. And there's also about a million places on Etsy that let you send in like a 3D print um, file, but they also have new services that, yeah, this one, Craft Cloud. So this Craft Cloud service is actually run by all 3DP, which is like the one of the biggest 3D printing organizations that is out there. And what they do is they actually gather quotes from a whole bunch of different 3D print services and comparing and, and build like a big table. So you upload the file that you want to be printed 
and it generates the price quote from like all the different 3D print services that are available. And then you send the print in and they mail it over to you. So if you don't have any local access to a 3D printer, you can go through Craft Cloud. And there are too many services that have cloud in the title. <laughs> it seems to be quite, yeah, popular, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And so that's like the, it's just cool. And so let me close a bunch of these. And if you also want to learn more about the uh, Finch robot and hummingbird bit, if you want to know where their activities are, they're actually just on the Bird Brain website. So you can go into the Teach tab, and then you can go into like through the Start Teaching process, and it will help you get started with setting up either the Finch or the Hummingbird bit. And it runs you through learning how to do basic programming, making the robot go forward, making the robot turn, making the robot use sensors, making the robot use the marker. And it will give you step-by-step -step tutorials based on your chosen device and programming language. And this one actually uses the, so the Finch blocks and the Bird blocks are the, they're sort of like the um, scratch style drag and drop block system that is used specifically by BirdBrain, but then they also use um, MakeCode, which is made through Microsoft. So if you want to transition from using block-based over to um, the text-based, you can shift over into the MakeCode. So you can see side by side what the block code looks like versus what the text code would look like. That's or so, so, cool. it's so helpful for, for learning it and understanding it, I think, having both of those. It totally is. And then if you are already comfortable with text-based, you can just go straight into Python or into Java. So, and Python is like, it's applicable to nearly everything now. So let me go up here. Most libraries actually choose their programming language based on the device that is available to them. So most of the small to mid-sized libraries say that they don't have enough devices or tablets to be able to use the robots themselves in their library. So I also circulate the Chromebook Duet Duo, the Chromebook, the Chromebook Duet, which is, it has a keyboard that's on the bottom and it has a tablet on top, but the tablet is detachable. So if you just want to be able to use the tablet part for any of these kits, you can do that, or you can connect it over to the keyboard to type in different commands and stuff. So it's pretty adaptable, and you can check them out as a tech kit. So if you don't have the devices available in your own community, you can check out both tablet and robot and use them together. And in which case, you would select Chromebook, and it will automatically gray out the languages that aren't compatible with that device. And you can choose your programming language based on the de device that you have available, which is handy. Bird brain technologies is not a bird brain at all because they're kind of a genius. <laughs> and I'll close that. So, this Oculus Quest headset is not new, but I have some new updates about it. So the Oculus Quest 2, when I first started this up, it actually required a Facebook account to be able to set up and use the Oculus Quest 2 headset. It's no longer the Oculus Quest 2. A lot of you probably know it's the MetaQuest now, but most of their instructions and tutorials, they'll call it either the Oculus or the Meta because transitions are messy. Mm -hmm. And so I've been calling it Oculus just because that's what most people knew it by. And sometimes they get confused if I say Meta. So I use both. Mm -hmm. 
And but now with the new update and the transition over to Meta, a Facebook account is no longer required. So there were some school libraries that weren't actually able to use this because their the school system automatically blocked Facebook. So they weren't able to use the headset because their system blocked Facebook. But now that's no longer a problem because they bypassed the Facebook setup and now it just goes through a meta app. So the, these headsets are all registered now through the meta app instead of routing through Facebook. Sometimes there are still a few little troubles with that, but it's a whole thing now. <laughs> And I also wanted to reiterate that Oculus Quest slash MetaQuest, they do have their own written guides that say they have their safety guidelines that say that only ages 13 and up can use this. So I had to write in that Oculus Quest policy that the library can only circulate it to ages 13 and up. And a lot of parents and a lot of individuals actually use the headset with younger users. Mm. Like I know there are a bunch of you, a bunch of people that use it with like nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, 12 year olds. But as mm. a library, just for liability purposes, um, we try not to do that. What happens in the individual library, I have no control over. But in the waiver itself, I just have to say 13 and up. And the only reason that Oculus does that is because the human eye isn't fully developed yet at the age of 13, and they're not fully aware of how short and long-term use of the Oculus headset will impact the development of the eye. And younger, and, younger kids. Yeah, in younger kids. Like in adults, right. the eye is fully developed and it's not going to sure. impact the development at all. Hmm. That's that interesting. I never would have known about that 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 would be something to think about, but. Yeah. And the other, yeah. Right. And like the other big factor that goes into it is that um, younger users don't yet have a perfect grasp of what the real world is supposed to look like. So they have trouble differentiating between the real and the virtual world. So when they take off the virtual reality headset, the transition back into the real world is jarring or they will believe that what's in the headset is actually real. And so it's caused like nightmares, it's caused disorient, like long-term disorientation, it's caused like weird phobias because kids think that what they just saw was real. And, mm -hmm. or they'll think that they'll see like little phantoms of what they experienced in virtual reality. So it's not just the development of the eye and the impact of like the develop like physical development. It's also that kids just don't know what's real from fake yet and they aren't able to process some different experiences yet. So that was the other big reason that Oculus said 13 and up. And I don't know how they landed on the magic number of 13 and not 12 or something. But every kid hopefully probably, talking to like medical professionals or I mean, I, something I, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there have been like a million experts. studies about, you know. And so they they say thirteen, so we say thirteen. And I can't control what happens if a library checks it out for like a younger age middle school. Sometimes they don't tell me and they wind up using it for middle school audiences. So this slide is here again. And there, you I know also- that You're signing off on a waiver when you do borrow this and- Right, you know, yeah, yeah. Remember that. And that way if kids, if parents let their kids use the virtual reality headset regardless of what the library says, and then the kid freaks out and experiences nightmares or some adverse reaction, then the library is safe in saying that you were aware and warned that this is only supposed to be used by 13 and up and it was your own personal choice that you used this with your nine-year-old child and now the effects of what happened are your liability and not the library's liability. Mm -hmm. And again, I hate phrasing it in that lawyerese, but we kind of have to. Yeah. 
Yeah. I never wanted to learn lawyerese. <laughs> yeah. It's a necessary thing. So now the next thing is once you've, so this is kind of like the biggest set of like the new stuff that's out there. And I'm sure there'll be more new stuff. But the next big question that I get is that, okay, cool. If we introduce our, all these kids and adults and all these people to virtual reality, robotics, um, artificial intelligence, and all this stuff that the, these tech kids are supposed to represent, what is the end goal of this? Why should we take our library time and resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's the point? So I started asking this question. If you train 20 virtual reality developers, where would they work in your community, across the state, around the world? Because most people are working remotely now. So it doesn't matter if you're in a rural community in the middle of Nebraska. It doesn't matter if you're in a small town that doesn't have like a bunch of different virtual reality jobs. You can still learn this stuff and get a job remotely. So if you were to train, if you were to expose these people to virtual reality technology, they decide that they want a career in it, where would they go? So, and I also wanted to reiterate that even though I say virtual reality, it could be anything. So these kits are actually designed to introduce, the simulation is like the virtual reality and augmented reality. It introduces the Internet of Things. It's, um, oh, they put augmented reality separately in the slide. Cool. Um, additive manufacturing is like when you use the 3D printed technology to build out a robot so you're reducing the cost of prototyping technology, like designing and prototyping technology that would be used in like manufacturing, healthcare, whatever. Um, I got a crown on my tooth and they actually use 3D printing technology to build a temporary crown um, while they were 3D printing the real one. So 3D printing is everywhere, but most people don't think about where this technology actually is and what the end goal is. So wow. this is, yeah, and I'm glad they made my tooth. I didn't have and, no idea they were doing things like that with it, but and, sure. <laughs> like, and I didn't either until I was actually in the chair and they said, let me just go real quick 3D print your tooth. And I was like, all right then. And they took all these different scans to kind of like scans of my mouth and scans of the original tooth got the sizing of it and then they took those measurements and made the temporary and then they sent the files off to a better like 3d printing technology that uses better more permanent material and then like a week later they had made the real tooth based on the scans that were in from my head and i was like that's cool more people should know that they do that mm -hmm. and so this slide is just like an example of the actual things that you are introducing to people using these tech kits as a male. So you can start making the next step that says, once we know what we need to be teaching, these are the technologies that are shaping the future of work, they're shaping the future of how we are recreationally working with each other, how we communicate, how we talk, how we live everyday life. It's baked into our smartphones, baked into our computers, baked into everything. But now, practically, we look at the library itself and say, who are we actually trying to reach and how are they going to be using, practically using these technologies? And most of it is career exploration for K through 12 and career changers. A lot of it is entrepreneurship because most of the jobs that are using these technologies don't exist yet. Mm. So if you want your community to thrive, you need to introduce them to these technologies and show them how they can change the jobs and improve the jobs that are there now, and then show how they can create new businesses by leveraging these technologies. And you're giving your community a leg up 
by helping people bridge the gap between these introductory technologies and then how technology is applied to your own community instead of just saying we did a cool activity now we're done yeah and you can also use it for things like community impact one of my favorite ones is that when people learn about the Internet of Things and smart technology and sensors, they can learn how to build a community garden. When you build a community garden, you can also increase food, um, food access. Like in the state of Nebraska, there's a lot of food deserts because it's hard to get fresh food shipped into a lot of the different rural communities across the state. So they actually have a map of just these large food deserts. But when you learn how to build a greenhouse and build a smart garden, you can have fresh produce almost all year round. And one of the biggest barriers to building a community garden is that you can't always get volunteers to staff it. But if you only have one or two volunteers and you build a smart garden, that smart garden is going to tell you exactly when everything needs to be watered. It'll tell you if, they nutri if the soil needs new nutrients. It'll tell you which nutrients need to be applied. Sometimes you can automate the application of the nutrients, or if you don't have that access to that type of tech, you can send a, an alert to the volunteer or to the coordinator of the program. So you only need one volunteer to go on demand to water or change nutrients. And it's easier to maintain like that community garden that you wouldn't have been able to have unless you had that smart tech. So cool. And all it takes is a Hummingbird Bit Premium Kit or another robot to show how the sensors work. You can even use Microbit. And so let me jump over here because one thing that was pointed out to me was that it's great that you know all this, but we don't know that all this necessarily as a librarian. Mm -hmm. So that's why I started putting together these different guides. So this top one here is to help people generally learn about Industry 4.0 technologies. It's a collection of resources. So when you click on this Learn More, it'll actually give explainers for like introductory level explainers for what this technology is. And it also gives additional resources. And what one really cool thing is that I actually just got an email from a local girls code club who said that they use this resource and then they actually recommended the addition of the ultimate generative AI glossary of terms because one of the old links had been was broken. Mm. So thanks. I added your resource. It's good that there's always new things being updated because when you know like you're getting new new things for the tech kids there's always changes and updates and things having in the whole right uh, in the whole techie world i guess i'll say i'll be very broad <laughs> and so libraries can use this to understand themselves how all this technology is designed made and put together so it talks about the teams that are necessary to actually build an AI system inside of an organization. It talks about a lot of the different, and this also talks about the careers that AI is generating in order to be able to integrate AI into different services. And then it shows different examples about how this is being used across different, like little snapshots of how this is being used. Um, I'm reformatting it so it actually just goes by industry, so there's little tabs, but um, it'll look like this. So instead it goes by industry use cases with little tabs. Hmm, nice. Because people said it was more helpful to go by industry and then mm -hmm find all the different examples in one spot. They're not wrong. Mm -hmm. I love that you're you know, listening to people telling, hey, I wish I knew more about it from this side or for that side, yeah. Right, yeah. At least our um, offerings here, yeah. I think this is important is to figure out what this is all, like I said in the early, a little before, 
you don't just go for these things because there's a new cool shiny thing you know right know what you're gonna then follow up with and why why are you having the kids or the adults whoever come in and use these things you need to have that kind of like there's got to be something beyond just oh that was fun now into something right. else <laughs> yeah and another thing that library said is that after they introduce this tech to their community whether it's to um, k-12 through high school adult or career changers they get a lot of people that want to learn more about it, but as librarians, we don't have all that information. We're not experts in AI. We're not experts in robotics or any of the things. So I scraped together these learning communities so that people can actually, these are communities that people can go online and actually talk to and interact and interact with different experts in that field. So even if you don't have a local source where people can go, like most definitely look at, like start local, find out if there's a university that actually has like a public arm where people can go in and ask questions. Some do, some don't. Find out if you have a, a like a local robotics club or a local anything and refer people local first. But if you don't have that, then you can go to the online learning communities. And you'll probably find out that a lot of your local members are also part of these same communities. So there's overlap anyway. And you can also follow um, curated blogs, podcasts, and associations. So a lot of times when people get interested and they want to find out if this is going to be a career or a pathway for them. They want to find out what's the latest, greatest ongoing trends. So these are the blogs and websites and podcasts that have all that latest and greatest. So you can, as a library, you can say you just learned about artificial intelligence, you just learned about robotics and automation. If you want to keep track of all this stuff, you can subscribe to these newsletters or podcasts and get into, like, get connected to the community in that way and get reliable information instead of um, the fear mongering or just mm. not, um, potentially unreliable resources. And there's also, so one of the other things that libraries asked is that um, it's awesome that you know all this stuff about tech and about the tech kits that you're able to choose activities that will help introduce different specific larger groups of technology. So I started putting together this database so that libraries can make the connection between the smaller activities that they're already used to doing. Like the dash and dot robot has this light wave activity. And when you trace it across to the other side of the chart, I put in um, video, like the YouTube videos about how that same technology is being used in real world businesses. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's to open water and it also opens up career pathways and medical research, entrepreneurship and all that. And if you go down through this, chart, you can see how you can use the simple activity to introduce the bigger technology, like using the seed, the dash and dot seed dispersal activity that's geared toward beginners for the second and third grade and translate it over to how to build a tree rover tree planting robot. And then show how this is kind of connecting over to the bigger picture and how the, the little thing they just learned translates over into something much bigger than they ever thought it was. And in that same vein, I started reformatting all the different preparation guides. So 
so far, I'll say most of the kits have these librarian preparation guides put together. Because most libraries have no idea how to get started with this. They like the technology is unfamiliar, the kits are unfamiliar, and just going to the website isn't always helpful. So these guides are just explainers about what the technology is. In this case, this is um Kai's Clan. So Kai's Clan is this fun little robot that has little grippers that kind of open and close, and it comes with a um, map. The, this one here is for the Mars rover, but you also have an automated, we also have an automated warehouse mat, and this mm -hmm. is actually geared specifically to introduce Industry 4.0 technologies, like mm -hmm. robotics, AI, IOT. But if the library or the school doesn't actually understand Industry 4.0 tech or how tech applies to all this different stuff, the kit activity kind of gets lost in translation. You can do an activity where you move a box from one side over to the other so that you're supposed to be moving the box to a different part of the warehouse, but that doesn't necessarily translate into jobs or into how this can be practically applied. Mm. So this walks you through general setup. So this is like the general setup is pretty much in every setup guide and every startup guide ever. And it links over to different resources through Kai's clan to be able to show how that works. But then it also digs into steps to actually learn the new technology as a, as a library or a school or um, local organization if you're working with like a local org. And I'm going to actually use the PDF because I fixed the layout. My color blocking format is better on the PDF. But I'll skip down to the learning pathways and teach tech. And so this actually shows. So the Learn New Tech is all the curated links to resources that will be helpful for that specific technology. And then there are different baked in activities that you can use to understand how that technology is impacting jobs. In this case, I use the example of the Smart Grocery Warehouse. Then there is, um, I put together this infographic for exploring related careers that are relevant to that specific technology. And then if you scroll down here, I put in little cheat sheets with robotics resources and career infographics. And these career infographics are all stuff that I made. So if it's like the images are fine. Most people ask about copyright and like all that stuff. So these are printables that you can hand out during activities that show careers that are relevant to robotics and with a QR code people can scan to learn more about it. So this is like the quick, easy way that people that are unfamiliar with robotics careers can use to introduce robotics careers. And this is a way that you can use to translate this on the left hand side is an example of how um, robots are being used in restaurants to be able to serve food to tables. The center panel is a an example of a feature of this larger robot. For example, it is a self-driving robot that has a return to home capability. And on the right hand side is a tech kit that you can use to introduce that specific feature. So if you want to show how self-driving works, use the Zoomy. If you want to show how robots talk to each other and synchronize, you can use the DJI Tello Swarm. And there's a bunch of stuff. And we're running just after 11 o'clock. So I do want to mention, you were talking about the Kai um, robots. Um, 
Amanda did do in a uh, previous Encompass Live. Pretty pe yeah. pretty sweet tech with the people from there. August 30th. It's in our, I was just looking up the exact when it actually was August 30th, and the archive, the recording is in our show archives. You want to know more detail um, about that specific product. Yeah. And I guess the last thing I'll say about that one is that there's the career infographics, and there's also a cheat sheet table that you can basically just read off of to introduce the technology. And that is down here. If you go to the learning pathway section, there is a three columns, the tech concept that you were introducing, the specific activity that you would go through in Kai's clan, and a tech explanation that you can basically read off of to show how this quick and easy activity is relating over to real world technology. So you can do the activity and then start a discussion using this explainer and show how the progression of skills actually relates to progressively more complex technology. And it goes from beginner to intermediate to advanced. So this is the format that I'm converting most of the other librarian preparation guides over to so that these charts are available because most librarians didn't have any idea about how to translate the simple thing over to the bigger technology because who in the world has time to go track down all the big technology <laughs> and you can also kind of click through these other resources if you want recommendations of other gadgets to introduce different industry 4.0 tech so there's just tables for free to mid to low to mid range to expensive technologies that you can get in your own library or experiment with, or some of them are available in the tech kits of mail, so you can try it before you buy it or just check it out and use it as an activity through that service. And if you want the career packs that have all those infographics, that slide has all those. I recommend just clicking through it so you can get a feel for what's all available in the career exploration stuff. It shows how the technology is designed and made, the careers that are available through it, the little charts that show how to take complicated technology and break it down into little component parts and then use technology activities to introduce those little components. And click through them, it's fun. And then this is a link to the page where you would go to check out the tech kit. If you are from out of the state and you want to find out how to, if you want to specifically find out how to replicate the service from scratch, this session was mostly about the updated activities and the new resources. I'll be doing a session at um, Computers and Libraries in March. Mm -hmm. um, talking about how to replicate the system as a whole. So if you happen to be going to that conference, then you can find out there. If you're not, you can email me. Um, there's my info. So we and, ran um, for computers and libraries. Look on our if you're in if you're in Nebraska, keep an eye on our blog and webs and and uh, mailing list. We usually have a um, offer for discounted um, registration. You go through us. Um, if you're here in Nebraska to um, to attend. Um. And I'll be doing two sessions and a workshop. So it'll be fun. <laughs> or just email me. It is I as I, I if anyone has watched this show before when I'm here talking with Amanda about things, uh, highly recommend computers and libraries. Um, but we've both been to it many, many times over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a great smaller conference. Uh, for anyone who is into the techie side of libraries or is just interested about it. Um, there and I, is suspect a, you, uh, hmm? I suspect if you go to the show a lot, you probably are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. 
and there's a uh, what I call a companion conference, um, the Internet Librarian, which is done in the fall, uh, which is the online um, version. I yeah. kind of think yeah. of it as um, they they used to have in person um, East Coast West Coast computers and libraries, East Coast Internet Librarian, West Coast, um, and now the Internet Librarian one has been uh, <clears throat> transitioned into just being an online event only. Um, and and they're doing different sessions now for each one of them. Like I'm not doing the same session the for yeah yeah well. yeah. Um, but we also offer a discount to that one as well if you want to attend the online version of the online Internet Librarian in the fall. So look for that next year. But computers and libraries coming up first. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the abbreviated version of what I got. I have other sessions that actually dig deeper into like how to assess community needs, assess like local career needs, and then select tech kits that will be able to introduce those. But that's not what this one was about. So there we go. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions, comments, thoughts you wanna um, uh, relate to uh, Amanda, you can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm monitoring that here. Um, we are a little after 11 o'clock, but if you do have any questions or anything you want to know about the tech kits, about how to use them, about anything that Amanda has talked about, any ideas of things you've used, ways you've used them in your library, um, I share with this. We can stick around as long as people do have things to say. Um, but um, as usual, this is a great session. You know, this is a great service. I'm glad that we have this. Um, this is something that the Library Commission has always done in some way, shape, or form. If, um, like the book it's club a lot for libraries to buy all of this stuff and test it out for themselves and yeah. not know if they're really going to be able to use it or understand it or have the time even to, to navigate and figure out what is all this stuff. Um, years ago, yeah. we, we did it with um, gaming uh, equipment. Uh, we loaned out things like uh, Dance Dance Revolution and um, a Guitar Hero and Wii's um, when that first started in libraries and before, you know, before um, it became more commonplace. Um, so you don't know how to do this, you're not sure and you don't have the time here, we figured it out for you, here's the thing, you can, you can you know, do a test run of it and then decide if it's something for your library or not. So um, I'm glad that we're still doing that um, now, years and years later, so with the, whatever is the newest things, yeah. And it's not that spectacularly different from the book club kit, because you can basically sure. check out a book club kit and use it for your book club. Yeah. So you can check out like a STEM theme kit and use it for your code club. Right, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be just you testing out how this thing is, but actually using it for an event, a, a program, yeah. Because there's up to 15 copies of each one of these available, so you can also use it for your own programming. Right. And I hesitate to use the word programming because you say program a robot, or you can do library programming, and people get confused. It's okay. It's both, yeah. <laughs> And I'm also glad that for the people that aren't in Nebraska, they can still get all the resources that are on the website, even though you can't borrow the actual yeah. physical yeah. items because that's only in Nebraska. Um, all of those um, help guides and resources um, are open and available for anybody. Yeah. Um, all right, I don't see any questions coming through. Just some thank yous, thank yous, and happy new year. Yes, happy new year to everyone that is coming up. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen to do my little wrap up here. Um, Amanda, send me your link to your slides and we will um, get those included when we do put the archive show archive up, um, which should be up by the end of the day tomorrow. Uh, but that'll wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to go to our Encompass Live main page, main website here. If you just use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, or the only thing on the internet called that, no one else is allowed to use it. <laughs> Um, and you will find either a link to our main page or a link to our archive page. Here's our main page with our upcoming shows for January and February of next year. Uh, but if you click down here, it goes to our archives, which actually I have over here, and you'll see all our most recent ones. Um, today's will be at the top of the list. Uh, it said it should be done by the end of the day tomorrow um, at the latest, as long as YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me. 
Um, everyone yeah. who attended today's show and um, registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. And we push it out to our various social media as well. Um, if you notice on our main page, we do have links to, um, we have a Facebook page over here. Um, if you like to use Facebook, give us a like and you'll get notifications. Here's your reminder of today's show, meet the presenter. And then um, here we go, we're announcing when the recording of the previous um, session uh, show is available. Uh, we also are on Twitter and Instagram and we use the hashtag NCUMP Live, a little abbreviation of our name there. So if you wanna keep an eye on what we're doing over that way. Um, this is our full show archives. I will, you can search here for any topic you might be interested in for the show, full show archives or just on the most recent 12 months if you want something really current. Um, and that is because, and I'm not gonna scroll all the way down. You can see this is a giant list here. Um, this is the full archives for Income Slime going back to when the show first premiered, which was in January of 2009. So uh, a lot of old stuff on here. Um, so just pay attention when you're watching an older show to the original broadcast date. There's always a date here. And so you'll know when it was originally done. Uh, some many of our shows will stand shows will stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, but many of them will become old and outdated. Resources may have changed drastically, might not no longer exist anymore. Links may be broken. Um, we do not have the time for the staff to go back and check years and years worth of these, so we don't always get that updated. Uh, people may work at a different library or somewhere totally different than when they first presented for us. So just pay attention to that. Um, original broadcast dates when you do watch any of our show archives. But this is something libraries do. We keep things for historical purposes often, and as long as we have a place to host them, which right now is the Library Commission's YouTube channel, we will um, uh, always um, have them up there for you. So that wraps up for today's show. Uh, starting eh, next year, <laughs> uh, <laughs> January 3rd is our, uh, uh, as I said, yes, Happy New Year to everyone, our next show. And you see, we've got a, a, a pair of sessions called Meet the NLC, part one and part two. Um, and these are sessions, we did these same type of things when the show first premiered in 2009, as I said. And we are redoing that again for the first time. Um, 2023 is the 15th year of Encompass Live. Wow. So we have been doing the show for 15 years. Um, I have no intention of stopping it at all. As you can see, we've got shows coming up. But um, to in honor of that, we are doing new Meet the NLC sessions, which is basically what is the Library Commission? Who are we? Um, what do we do here? Uh, because we do so much, it does have to be split up into two shows. So um, next week, um, part one, you'll talk, you'll just meet our, our um, agency director, Rod Wagner, uh, Vern in computer services, Lisa information services, and Mary at, in government information services librarian. And then the second half of it, part two, will be me talking about my department, library development, Tessa, who's our communications coordinator, Gabe through the talking at the Talking Book and Braille service, and Devra, who's our technology and access services director. So um, if you want to know more about the library commission and kind of things we do there here, um, please do sign up for those two shows. As I said, that will be uh, the beginning of our 16th year of the show. Epic. Huh? Epic. <laughs> it's a little, it's a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little stunned, but hey, <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to keep doing it and getting all this information and, and um, helping librarians keep doing their jobs and learning new and wonderful things to do at their library. And so you see there's other, other shows coming for January and February. Um, got some of the February shows scheduled too. And Amanda will be back as usual on January 31st. That's the last Wednesday in January. I feel like I need to find a way to get the little like party popper animation to go during that show. So it just like does a celebration popper. Oh, for the next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to see. I'm putting together a presentation, the slides for everyone. So we'll see what kind of animated uh, celebratory things we'll, we'll do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I know the questions from everybody. So thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you all for um, 15 years of Encompass Live. I'm getting a little 
overwhelmed here, but <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll see you all. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do the cliche joke because you kind of have to see you all next year. <laughs> Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got the dad jokes. <laughs> yeah. Don't have to be a, a an actual dad to have dad jokes. Um, we'll see you, you all. You weren't gonna say it, I was. <laughs> <laughs> see you all next year on and Health is Live. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.